Oh, oh, hey, sorry, sorry, everybody. Just, just, uh, just finishing up my chicken wings here. I guess that was inappropriate since I'm doing a birding thing, but I love wings. Got to tell you, love. No, no wings were actually sacrificed. It was really a pretzel. So, um, I'm Ron Myers, and I actually ate dinner earlier. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. This is our last show for the evening. We've got several more planned throughout the weekend. Uh, hopefully you have an opportunity to join us. I'm from the Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage, so it says over here. Um, it's an organization uh, composed or started by the Audubon Society, Buffalo Audubon Society, Burroughs Audubon Nature Club in Rochester, the Audubon uh, Community Nature Center in Jamestown, and the Presque Isle Audubon Society in Erie. So uh, we have an, it's an annual event that we've held for 61 years. This year we were supposed to have it on site in the, as we always do, in Allegheny State Park, a 65,000 acre park located south of Buffalo. We've had it there because of the wonderful opportunity to view uh, great birds, uh, botany, et cetera. During the course of the weekend, which is open to the public, we normally host over 100 programs uh, that are, as I said, available for everyone from early morning to late night. So bird banding, owl prowls, astronomy, uh, beginning birds, uh, a nature study from all aspects for families, etc. cetera. So, um, but I'm gonna talk about, this is gonna be a, a little bit of an irreverent view of birders. So uh, before I get started, um, you know, so people ask, you know, what's, what's your expertise in birds? Are, are you the best birder in the world? And, and there, there was a band called the Beatles. Um, the Beatles uh, uh, had the, a drummer, Ringo Starr, and the, one of the guys in the band, John Lennon, who wrote much of the music, a reporter years ago had asked him, so is Ringo Starr the best drummer in the world? And John Lennon's response was, he's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. Uh, so that's kind of where I fit in. I'm jack of all trades, master of none, although I do have, uh, as opposed to a lot of the people that have presented so far that have just wonderful credentials, I have a degree in accounting, marketing, and engineering. So uh, that doesn't fit into the biology. But I've been leading beginning birds since 1970. And at Allegheny State Park, I've probably had the opportunity during the course of the pilgrimage since I've been leading hikes to leave somewhere probably around eight to 9,000 people on my various walks. Uh, so uh, uh, that I guess that in itself is my qualification. So what I'd like to do is kind of get in here and I would like to share, I'm going to bring up my screen here. Uh, let's see, how about we do this one down here? Bingo. And we're going to do a slideshow from the beginning. That's a very good place to start. So um, we're going to ask a lot of good questions this time. And so part of it is, is it's going to be somewhat uh, a fun time, uh, but I hope you learn something in the process about bird watching. Besides the fact that it's a bunch of people with crazy hats. I mean, why why is it the bird watchers have to wear crazy hats? Uh, we've got Owen Wilson down there in the corner. He was, uh, uh, I think it was called The Big Day, a movie one time, but we've got some great hats. This guy here, uh, and I pulled off the internet. I'm not sure if I were him, I would have pulled that picture down by now. Uh, here's some other uh, wonderful hats. They're all out there. They got their binoculars strapped over their shoulder, et cetera. Uh, and then in 1963 at the pilgrimage, this guy here was, was trying to get his hat on here a little bit. He, uh, he was trying to uh, make himself uh, uh, one of the crowd with that hat. He was six years old. That would be me uh, at the sixth, no, let's see, 1963. It was the fourth uh, Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage. So one of the questions that people always ask is, wait a second, why do birders wear funny hats? And there's a red-winged blackbird. How come there's no such thing as a black-winged redbird? So we hope to answer those questions today. Um, and then along the way, I said, we'll hopefully learn something. Again, why? why? Why do people watch birds? So that's kind of one of the things we're going to talk about. You know, bird watching is one of those things that um, especially with COVID right now, there's an opportunity to stare out your window, see a wild bird, and kind of become fascinated with the diversity of birds that there are out there. And once you get into it a little bit more, it's fun, but it's not that important to become obsessed with what it is, where you saw it, checking it off on the checklist, 
but it's something that you may become addicted to and want to try. So, you know, and birds also are a great indication of the environment. There's, there's birds where I live. I live just west of Philadelphia. When I first moved here, you'd never see a black vulture. That was very unusual. Black vultures from the south. My mom, who grew up in upstate New York, would never see a cardinal. Well, there's been these patterns of birds coming up, whether it's due to feeders or changing climate. Um, there's a lot of work that has been done by citizen scientists. So it's one of those things that, you know, that's a great way to watch birds. We're going to talk in this about where to find and observe birds, binoculars or not. Do I have to waste money on buying binoculars if I don't have them? So in all the books, they always have bird characteristics. And one of the things is, okay, if I'm going to use binoculars, what am I looking for when I do see a bird? Uh, choosing a bird guide and how to use it. Online resources. Um, we're going to do some bird calls, maybe. Well, you can listen to them online. And then finally, what I call the noises to impress or alienate your friends. Now, in keeping with the thing, I've decided to don one of my several funny hats that I'm going to employ here. So uh, let's see. I'm going to stop this a second. Um, binoculars or not. So here, <clears throat> one thing I want to share with you. Growing up, I had the uh, I had these uh, binoculars here. Bushnell, you can go online right now and probably pick them up on eBay for uh, 30, 40 bucks. Boy, the, <clears throat> those wings were hot. Mm, wow. So yeah, you can pick those up relatively cheaply. Um, the other binoculars here, probably pick these up for 20 bucks online. Can you see it? Does it magnify? Yeah, sure it does. It magnifies it a little bit. Um, you can pick these up probably cheap online for 20, 30 bucks. Um, the other thing too is these help you to find birds better than any other binoculars. I found that people that use these binoculars see more things, more interesting things. Um, and it involves, uh, you can't look through them at all, but you mm, drink out of those. Um, I don't recommend it. There was nothing in that. So, uh, but, uh, yes, they, they help some of these birders out there to achieve that. So finally the bird, the binoculars I have right now are called Monarch sevens. Uh, they're in the, what you call the mid range or even the lower, the, the affordable range. Um, I like them. They're four to $500 you can buy. Again, is it necessary to have binoculars? Not necessarily. So, uh, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen here and, uh, let's, so one of the things, uh, I pointed out is do you, whoops, do you really need to spend $2,800 on a pair of binoculars? Probably not, but if you want to impress all the birders, once you get a little good, you know, you go out and you're walking along with all the birders and, you know, you pull out your Swarovski, you know, $3,000 binoculars. And the other end of the stream, you see these $22. One of the things I'll talk about is, okay, what are the objectives in doing, picking binoculars? So cost is a big thing. It's like, okay, I've got $300. The internet is a great place to start. Also, if they ever let us out and travel outside of our house, we can go to stores and actually try them. Um, probably take a lot of disinfectant with you. But magnification, people say, ah, I got to have more power, big power. That's the only way I'm going to see these birds. Well, um, magnification is important, but also it's not that important. Too much magnification and you can't hold the binoculars still. So um, field of view is great. You want a good crystal clear field of view. Stability. Um, that comes back to, you know, they have, some of these have self-stabilizing components to them. Weight, you don't want to be dragging something around with you all the time that's heavy. So, um, magnification. So, mine are eight, and I think these are exactly wherever my binoculars are. Um, mine are, uh, mine are eight by 42. How convenient. That's a great thing. Uh, it's a great amount. And it used to be seven by 32s where I think the, uh, the Bushnells I have over there. It just opens up and provides a greater field. You'll see that. An eye cup. And then um, that's a great way to start off. Get an 8x42, a 7x32, that's, that's perfect. Um, and as I said, spend some time on Google checking them out. Um, we're going to go into characteristics of birds, but I just want to show you a couple things on binoculars here. When uh, most of binoculars, you know, especially if someone hands them to you, you're not used to using them. Uh, a lot of times there's a center focus right here. Use the center focus. You, you generally focus with the left eye first. You get up there and you kind of focus that. And then you use the center focus. You use the center focus first to, to do the right eye. And then you 
use the left eye just by itself like that. So um, you, each binoculars will have its own instructions for setting the focus. So, but it's, it's kind of helpful to, to do that. And then once you set it for your eyes, then you can use the, the center button to always use the focus. Now, one of the things that uh, people always find difficult to do is how to see the bird. A lot of people like, they do the scanning. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go left to right, right to left, all that up and down. The best thing to do is start by finding the bird and then bring the binoculars up into the field of view. So uh, that's probably the best thing to do, um, the, uh, uh, to, to use the, the uh, binoculars. So, man, it's warm in here. Should have uh, turned the air conditioning on. Anyway, okay, so let's keep going here. I'm gonna share this again, bring this up. Characteristics. Um, I should have brought that down so quick. So one of the things you do, you're gonna go out and you're gonna find, you know, you see a bird and you know you're gonna use a book at some point, but let's say you're out walking without a, uh, without, you're out walking and you don't have anything right now. Uh, so as my son just pointed out, you won't see birds with the lens covers on. So very quick, uh, legs, short or long. One of the common characteristics is a crest. Does the bird have a crest? Something to look for. Does it have a bill? You know, what does the bill look like? Is it big? Is it conical? Does it look like a duck? Yeah, get rid of that. Oops. Okay. Uh, merganser. It's got a, here's a merganser bill here, a, a redhead bill here, a pied bill. Here. Let's look at all the different kind of bills out there. So when you finally go back to the book, you've kind of remembered certain characteristics. Another bill. Uh, this is like a, 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 a long woodpecker's bill. This is a, uh, a bird that might be eating insects. Notice the small bill. When I pull up the, the guidebooks, you'll see that they focus on the same kinds of things. What does the tail look like? Is the tail, you know, up and down? Is it bobbing, going up and down? Any characteristics that you can use to find that is really helpful. How does the bird fly? Is it going to be fl flying up and down? Like, well, I guess it helps it's that way. So, um, yeah, so it's, there's the bird, it's going along and it has a certain pattern. Well, goldfinch flies like that. People always ask me, they say, you know, have you ever, where do I see an eagle? I say, I see eagles all the time. Where are you looking? Well, up in the sky, et cetera. But I happen to know what I look for. If I see something like this, it's a turkey vulture. If I see a big bird that looks like this, it's probably an eagle. Where I live outside, west outside of Philadelphia, I see eagles all the time. Does it have wing bars? You know, all these things are perfect, so. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen so you can see this here. I'm gonna hide my picture, stop on video. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right, can you see that now? Hey, Chris, can you see that picture? Okay, there's nothing there. How about that? It's, it's good now. Okay, good, excellent. So uh, for all those crummy pictures I just showed, um, uh, I actually have been, I've drawn a little bit in the past and I thought I would try to redeem myself with those, uh, those stick figures. So uh, these are some of the drawings that I made. It has nothing to do with beginning birds other than it redeems myself over the, uh, the crummy pictures that I've, I was just showing you. So those characteristics are really important. So some of the things, you know, as you start to look at this, you can say, okay, what is something common about all these birds? One of the things I pointed out, they all have crests. So now the bird on the left has a de definite conical bill. We all know most of these birds. The bird on the left is a, a cardinal. The bird on the right is a blue jay. The bird in the middle is a tufted titmouse. And their bills are, are structured to feed the way they feed. You know, we, we see the, uh, the cardinals cracking larger seeds open and, and the the titmouse grabbing a little seed off our bird feeder and flying away and pecking at it in the, in the trees. So. Now, here's another thing. Here's another example. Okay, what uh, I know my friend Patrice is on. She called me up and said, I got this bird with this kind of weird tuft on the side of its head. And uh, so on the far right, you see a yellow-crowned night heron. Uh, 
But again, so you're looking at the two birds on the left, it's like, wow, they, they look exactly the same. Well, except that one has got bright yellow legs. Huh, that must be a greater yellow legs. The guy in the middle is a willet. But again, you're looking for characteristics. So finally, when you get in front of that book, you can start to say, ah, okay, that's it. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing here a second. Uh, and I'm gonna make it so you can actually see my pretty face. Uh, let's see. Start video. Perfect. There we go. So there's a lot of bird books out there and I'm going to show you a little bit about each one here. What I recommend doing is, um, people have bird books and I know it's the first few pages actually cover a lot of what, um, what I've been describing here. In fact, I'll bring you some close ups of some of the bird books. I've got Peterson's guide. You know, the thing is, is uh, Peterson's Guide, the Sibley Guide, they're all based in ta taxonomic order, which means um, the, supposedly the way they evolved is the order in which they, they appear. So you have to know, okay, it's kind of a warbler to begin with. And so warblers are found here in the book. Um, the, uh, and I'll talk about some online resources as well, because there's some, some things there that are great for identifying birds where you put in information and you can get uh, information out. This is an older book. This is the, the, the Audubon book, and it would sort it by, um, you know, types of birds. You can kind of see the bird over here and then color within those kinds of birds. So it, it was kind of convenient. I used to, when I used to teach beginning birds in the, the early 80s, late 70s, I would say, you know, get a couple books and, and compare them. So uh, this is an older book, too, that I, I kind of like. It had this kind of neat thing in it, which, um, again, you have to kind of know what it was. But, you know, you come down here, it's like, oh, swallows. Well, um, you could kind of furl the book like this, and then you could draw lines on it and go right, right to that page where it was. So that was kind of a little gimmick. All the bird books got some kind of gimmick. Oh, wait a second. I need another hat. Oh, how's that? That's another crazy hat. Um, one of the, uh, uh, and this thing here is not a pocket guide. You know, when, when Peterson first came up with the pocket guides in, you know, he came up with the first kind of real bird guide. He wanted to make it so it could fit in your back pocket, carry it around. It was restricted to the eastern part of the United States and had key characteristics in it. And I'll show you a couple examples that I've got photographs of that I'll bring that up online. This is not so much of a field guide. It's a great, a wonderful book that talks about, you know, kind of bird behavior characteristics. I mean, what I've just talked about, what the things look for, is right in the very beginning of these books. I, I would like to take complete credit for it. And both Sibley and Peterson consulted me first before writing their bikes or writing their books. But um, no, I can't take that credit. So, uh, but spend some time in the first few pages of the book. They talk about the things that I've just talked about, which is identifying certain characteristics, wing, you know, wing bars and bills and things like that. So it's a great book. This is a fun time. Um, uh, don't read it if you're going to go to bed at night because it'll probably, you know, cause you to die of asphyxiation. So uh, let, me, uh, let me go back here to a couple more things. I know I'm going back and forth, but uh, let's try this one right here. Here we go. So how to pick a guide. Um, this is what I was just talking about, the Peterson guide. Now I'm going to talk to you, and, and all the books have kind of, as I said, each one's got their own little gimmick. Uh, but here we are, just, you know, you look at it, exactly what I was talking about. What is the shape? What do the wings look like? How is the bill shaped? Does it climb trees? How does it behave? You know, is it is its tail bobbing up and down? And these are all the classic things that are in the book. And so uh, instead of sitting here listening to me ramble on for 25 minutes, you know, you can go to the book, but and, you know, people say, well, which book is best? There is no right answer to which bird book is best. A lot of people right now really go with the David Sibley books. Um, I'm still kind of a Peterson fan. Um, Somewhere I have a picture of me actually birding with Peterson. So this is the inside. It was kind of the same thing, kind of a color coded. So you could go and look at various colors and, you know, down at the bottom, you see, well, uh, where is it? Geese, swans, and ducks. I like this one, chicken-like birds. It must be gallinaceous birds, but a lot of these are gallinaceous birds. Um, so you have the green down here, the kind of, okay, I'm going to go to ducks, which is a little bit helpful. Um, oh, the other thing too is this was Peterson, uh, he revolutionized this idea. You can see up here, this arrow. The arrows pointed to things in particular that were noteworthy. So when you're observing birds, and I said, look for those characteristics, 
those are the things you got to kind of look for. So, um, and they point out and those are, oh, you know, be sure to look there. Like, here's one thing here. Um, uh, so there's a downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. And so the hairy woodpecker, just like I said, it says, you know, if you look at the bills up here, we always, in the field, they look exactly the same. Hairy is like an exaggerated downy, especially its bill. The bill on a hairy woodpecker is the width of the head of the bird, whereas a downy is smaller. So, you know, you're kind of confused. Those kind of birding observations, you're looking out your, you don't need binoculars for, a lot of times you can see those right out your front door, so. Um, all right, uh, you know, before I say what about behavior, here's an Eastern Phoebe over here on this side, <clears throat> and, uh, and you can close down your, your gallery view there so you can see the full screen. <clears throat> but it says, you know, the uh, Epidonix uh, flycatchers, they all flick their tail upward. Well, the, the Phoebe is one of the first birds that come around in spring, like almost the same date every year. I expect to see a Phoebe uh, appearing in my backyard and you always see them and you get this, they'll come out there and they've got the tail going like this back and forth. It's like in the woods or near a house, it's most likely going to be an Eastern Phoebe. So, um Online resources. So, um, you know, a lot of people, are, they're moving to online stuff. You know, God forbid they sit in front of a computer and watch a guy talk about beginning bird watching. But yes, here's, a, uh, here's an opportunity here. So one of the best things, Cornell University in Sapsucker Woods is where kind of the, uh, that's the top ornithology school probably in the world. And they provide a lot of great online resources. And one's called All About Birds. You can go in there and search a bird. They have, uh, they actually produce a software called Merlin. I'll show you a little bit about Merlin, um, which you can download to your phone and then enter certain characteristics and it helps you at least refine it. I think in all these things, it really helps, you know, as I said before, am I the, the best expert? No. Uh, I get down to shore birds in the fall and I, I sit there and I kind of shrug my shoulder and I've even been with, with people who are like great birders and they're going, they, they're bickering back and forth on what it is and what it isn't. So again, I think to have the appreciation to go out there, oh, new hat, have the appreciation for going out there and just looking at these other birds. So um, All About Birds is a great resource. And I mentioned Merlin. Merlin, again, is from Cornell. All this is free. Um, they have this thing kind of bird ID wizard, a step-by-step. -step. You can go through each one of the, you know, what color, what size of bird it was, and it helps you at least narrow it down. So again, it's a great resource. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit of a birding snob here. Um, and, and I kind of against that, I mean, some birders are real experts. They'll trample over beautiful wildflowers to get to see a bird. Well, this bird on the left, uh, this photo, is called a Blackburnian warbler. I don't know if it even says that, but whatever. Yeah, it's a blackbird even more. Well, yeah, it does say that. Um, and I talked about characteristics and where to find birds, like up in trees and next to water and uh, in bushes. Well, this character is usually in the tops of trees, and you're going to like hurt your neck trying to find them. And these guys, normally, you have to have a pair of binoculars, and they have a very high pitch call, and they're a gorgeous bird, but no way, no way. Can a guy take a woman, grab their cell phone, and get a picture like that with their iPhone? Impossible, unless it's in a bird, you know, unless it's in somebody's hand. So I thought it was kind of cute, but not realistic. Uh, they should come up with something easier that, like a blue jay or something. I guess everybody knows what a blue jay is. But it, and a black burning warbler just looks so pretty. The warblers are are coming through. They're probably passed through right now. You know, this time of year, especially on Facebook, you see people posting pictures of the migration uh, with Doppler radar. You can see all the birds coming through. And some of these birds, these little guys come up from Central and South America. They fly all the way up here and they're pretty darn exhausted. These guys eating, see that little bill there? He's eating little insects as they fly along, uh, trying to get some nourishment. You won't see those at a feeder. Uh, Feeder birds are, you know, we pretty much know the 30 birds that are going to come to our bird feeder, and warblers generally won't come there. Um, now, Audubon is always a good one, too. I, I pointed out yesterday, I really kind of like this character over here. I'm not sure. He looks a little, this one here is really happy. He, he's a little concerned. This person here is looking at me. Um, they got those small little binoculars. And then this person's looking in a completely different direction. They're in a bird blind somewhere, obviously staged 
the photograph, they could at least look at the same way and maybe had a different expression. But it's, this poor kid over here, he really like, I don't see what you're looking at, everybody. So uh, now, uh, but Audubon online too, you know, you can get some information from them. There's a lot of free, again, going online, I'll show, I think I've got one here in a couple minutes here, some free online applications. Um, this is an indigo bunny and, and it's great that it shows here. Beautiful bird. Uh, we're, we'll see it in a little bit when I talk about bird calls. Um, but uh, the, uh, the indigo bunning is a classic example of a bird that we see at Allegheny State Park. And I don't need binoculars generally to see it, even though it may be 100 yards away. It'll be calling, we'll talk about the call a little bit later, and it's sitting at the very top of a tree. It'll be sitting at the top of a, a pine tree or the top of any kind of tree. Not a low tree, generally a very high tree, just sitting up there, I'm beautiful, can't you see me? And they are, they're beautiful. So um, a very, very common bird we see at Allegheny State Park. We see them down here in Pennsylvania as well. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a great bird. And I miss, uh, I miss seeing the ones at Allegheny. This is birding, a wa uh, bird watching headquarters. I think they're always trying to sell me something. So uh, I, I generally don't go there. I just pretty much, to be honest with you, I pretty much stick with the, uh, the uh, uh, Cornell All About Birds. Now, once you start finding out the birds, you may want to contribute to citizen science. So um, citizen science, uh, there's eBird, again, Cornell Lab, you see it up in the corner. Citizen science here, um, you know, they've had a Christmas bird count for I think 116 years, where every year they go out and count birds uh, around Christmas time. And uh, that all that data is available online. In fact, you can search it and search all that compendium of data forever. But this is where you can actually enter information about what you see, wherever you've, wherever you've seen it. Now, I've, I've been spending time doing a lot of other things, and so I've been really bad about it. But you can go in and you can create an account. It's all free. You can go in and I've got a one called Yard, the birds that I see in my yard. I've got like, I guess, 65 or 70 species. I could probably, if I spent some time outside instead of doing, you know, being in front of the computer, I'd probably see some more. But um, yeah, I, I see a lot there. You can put your location, you can put different locations around the United States. Plus, you can also search the data. So here I just typed in Northern Cardinal, but if you wanted to type in something unusual like, well, Kirkland's Warbler, which you'd never see, but maybe a Harlequin duck at the shore, something beautiful and unusual or whatever, what a lot of times I'll just type in Northern Cardinal. And then each one of those dots here, um, I can zoom in on that. And then I can see the bird list that was compiled along with the observations made. So I can find out other birds that were seen uh, before I do my Christmas bird count. I lead one of the sections around here. And so I can go find out, you know, maybe somebody else has seen something that I haven't. And I can go do some search. So tremendous amount of data. And it's a uh, uh, a very helpful resource, and you can go online and look at that. Here's another, as I said, free apps, uh, Merlin from Cornell. I like this one down below here. Um, I, I copied this off the internet. I love this. Scott's Bird ID. You know, they're notorious for putting down, like, chemicals on your lawn that kill the insects and then the, kill off the birds, and you can't find this app anymore, but uh, I would love to have had that one. That would have been a good one. Scott's Bird ID, you know. Um, you'll see fewer birds if you use our products, but, you know, uh, so, so anyway, there's a, there's, you spend some time on the internet, you can find some, there's some that are free, give them a shot, try them out. The Merlin's probably the best thing for the, the money, which is, would be free. So, um, okay. Uh, I always like to throw that we, we sometimes use mnemonics to, uh, you, you can go online to a lot of courses and they have, oh, you know, you can file this histogram or whatever it's called when it comes to, uh, uh, birds sounds and seeing it is always helpful. I always learned that when they we associate a name with a bird or a sound. So I'm going to play this and hopefully you can hear some of these. Um, we tear, we tear, we tear, 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 tear. I mean, that's an easy one. Cardinal. Yeah, cool. Now, um, this is the tufted titmouse and he just says, Peter, 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 Peter. Yep. Yeah, an easy one. Yeah, I like that one. And then Red Winged Blackbird, Oka Lee. Oka Lee. So that's, that's a, yeah, I like that one too. All right, stop it. 
Yeah, we gotta pause. Come on, pause. All right, we're gonna pause. We're gonna the next page. Now, oh, oh yeah, you're gonna start up too. These crazy birds. All right, so um, I'm gonna tell a story because I think my friend's online too. Years ago, we went backpacking. Every 4th of July, we go backpacking in upstate Pennsylvania. I was my wife, Becky, and my friend, Al, and his wife, Pat, and we'd go up. Um, and, you know, we, we'd take our small little tents and we were going place to place. And, we set up the tent and along the way, I said, oh, I hear, I hear a rufous-sided toad, an Eastern toady now. I hear a toady. And uh, I says, it says, drink your tea. He goes, You're, uh, what? I says, yeah, it says, drink your tea. So we go to bed that night, you know, we're tired out. And about 4.35 o'clock in the morning, the next day, the birds start singing. And I think there was a, a toady right outside his window or outside his tent, probably a foot away. And it was drink your tea, drink your, and he just woke up and I kind of startled me. He goes, drink your darn tea. I think he used different words than that, but this is, there, there could be families involved here. I'll play uh, drink your tea here. Drink your tea. And then uh, uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a red-eyed veery, and they actually have a little red eye, and you never see them. They always sit at the tops of the trees, and it'll be a bird that you can hear when you're walking around, and it says, see me, hear me, here I am, see me. Okay, let's see if you can sing here. Come on there, buddy. And very common in Allegheny State Park, and very common throughout the Northeast. So a great bird. Uh, you'll always hear them. You'll never see them. Um, okay, you guys shut up. Okay, they're both behaving. Now, the indigo bunning down here, you have to really listen to this really well. And they actually, a lot of birds have different dialects based upon where they're from. So um, indigo bunning, where I live here outside of Philadelphia, actually has a different, slightly different call than the ones at Allegheny. I kind of grew up in upstate Western New York. Um, and I, I could easily identify the indigo bunnies here, you know, and I go out here and I still remember, oh yeah, that's probably an indigo bunny, but they do have different dialects throughout the country. So it's kind of interesting here. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna have a little water here, getting ready to do my own owl calls. Okay, listen, we'll see if he says, come on. Oh, this guy's, stop it. Oh, wait, I gotta have this guy stop here. You go. Fire, fire, where, where, here, here, let's put it out. Yeah, so that's, that's the indigo bunny. And, and for those of you, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're out and you hear this call and there's a bird perched on the very top of a tree, that's probably that beautiful bird right there. So now, Oh yeah, who's singing now? We're gonna go into the next page and make them quiet down. Okay, so here's another thing too, if you really want to, uh, or as they say, impress or alienate your friends. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a couple uh, bird calls here, things that kind of work. So you're, you're walking along in the woods and uh, you pass a pine grove, it might be winter time. In fact, that's a, an ideal time. You're, you're walking, maybe you hear some little chirping here and there, you walk along and uh, you, um, you hear some chirping and you say to your friends, why goodness, I believe, I think I can call these birds right to us. I think that there are probably some nuthatches and some titmice and I believe that there's probably some woodpeckers and some chickadees um, and so I'm gonna do this now they sense it as a little bit of a distress. Um, you don't want to cause undue uh, burden to the birds and cause them too much stress. That's why I'm against playing a lot of bird calls to them, especially during uh, nesting season or even in the winter. Uh, it may cause them uh, too much distress, but a lot of times they're moving through the trees and usually pine trees or hemlocks and And they'll just start coming down. And I have friends online, or they're friends on right now. They've witnessed this, and they can attest to the fact that it works. And so uh, that's that's something that you can 
uh, show your friends. The other thing too is there's a bird, it's called a gray, a gray cat bird. And uh, they're a mimic thrush, they kind of like a mockingbird. Um, it'd be nice if I had a picture, but you can go to your guidebook and look up cat bird. Um, and uh, they're generally gray, except they got a little uh, uh, rust color on their rump. So, uh, uh, and the underside of their tail. But, uh, and my wife said, oh, show them the picture. I took my two-year-old grandson out and we walked not far from his house. And I says, I said, Connor, I'm gonna show you that I can call these cat birds over here. So you, you take your hand and you just make a kissing sound on your hand. And the cat birds will come out there trying to find out what's going on. They'll come right out of the, they'll come out of the brush and they'll like, they want to take one good look at you and decide, nah, you're okay. You're not like a dying bird or dying animal. I'll see you later. But uh, my, my grandson was impressed. So I'm not sure, you know, probably when he gets to three, this will be like, ah, grandpa, that's crazy. So, uh, but uh, now the other thing too is um, when I do, I do a night walk and uh, at Allegheny and a lot of times we, I'd like to do an owl prowl, but the problem with an owl prowl is that um, you can't always guarantee seeing owls. We do astronomy. Well, typical weather, I think in uh, Allegheny State Park um, and folks that live up there way can, can confirm, I believe it's raining tonight. So, uh, uh, but if you're sitting around a campfire one night, having maybe a beer with somebody or just having a soda, uh, I have to have some water because what you want to do um, is, and you may want to follow along with me here, we're going to call a screech owl. And a screech owl requires, you need a wet uvula. So make sure you moisten your uvula first. Um, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to wet my uvula. Ah, uh, and so for everybody that's wondering what that is, you ever see the cartoons years ago with a little boxing thing in the back of your throat? That's your uvula. And I get a little water on that or a little bit of spit. And because what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to whistle and then cause my uvula to vibrate. And I get a, a perfect screech owl call. Hold on. Depends on if I'm talking too much, which my wife will say I always do. So here we go. So that is moistening the uvula. I see, oh, I see some folks here having a sip. Yeah, don't choke. <laughs> yeah, so you, these are things you can try at home. They'll be safe. So uh, yeah, and you, you, you gotta be able to whistle and you gotta be able to kind of gargle at the same time. That's really what happens. And uh, I, I've set out uh, a couple times in my 25 years of leading that night hike, I've had uh, screech owls actually fly through people's hair like, because they're territorial. They want to come down and like, well, we don't want another screech owl around. And I'll have a, sometimes I'll have a couple, sometimes I'll have none, you know, it's a bust. That's when we turn on the fluorescent light, look at fluorescent minerals. But, you know, we get a, you know, once in a while we'll get a, we'll get a screech owl. And for, for years I had them in the backyard where I live right here. I could sit out here by the campfire and, and uh, call owls and have screech owls come in. And, and in course there's also uh, barred owls at Allegheny State Park. I'm trying to focus on things we, we normally would see at, at Allegheny State Park and the barred owls, they say, you know, who cooks, who cooks, who cooks for you all? It's like, woo, 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 woo. so that is a barred owl. Um, again, you have to have really good friends before you try to pull this stuff in front of them. So, uh, but uh, that was pretty much it. I, I said it would be kind of a whirlwind thing. Uh, I didn't beat up birders too much. I hope you learned a little bit of something about, uh, you know, identifying birds or, you know, uh, gargling with your uvula to call a screech owl. So uh, questions, we don't have many people online here. I don't think so. If you'd like, uh, you can just unmute yourself. I don't know if there's any chat out there. Um, Chris, let me know if there was any chat questions or if anybody has any questions about, you know, uh, some people asked yesterday about some birding apps. Uh, feel free to ask questions and I will attempt to answer it. Don't, don't forget, I'm not an expert. But well, I we have someone. Can you hear me? Yep. We have someone asking, what is the rarest or most unusual bird you've observed over the years? Where was okay. it in the city or further out in nature? Uh, okay. Um, as opposed, is, is, was that Maggie asking that question? 
It's from Lisa and Mark Young. Okay. Yeah. So um, the uh, uh, the most unusual bird I've ever seen was there was a writer for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, uh, Floyd King. And this goes back into the 60s and 70s. And he was the outdoor writer. He knew, you know, m my father was the president of Burroughs Audubon. My mom was president of Burroughs Audubon. My dad was president of the Academy of Science. So they knew the, you know, people in the area. So uh, Floyd King calls my dad up. He says, we got a European goldfinch in our bird feeder. Now, um, they're very unusual. Uh, they're obviously from Europe. Um, so he came over and watched it uh, at his bird feeder, but he didn't want anybody to know. And this goes back to the bad behavior of birders. A lot of times when some unusual bird seen in your backyard and you post it, all of a sudden you got people crawling up through your house. They're like stalking you. They're climbing over your bushes. And they got to go see this bird. So he didn't want to tell anybody. He only told my dad. So uh, we went over and saw the European goldfinch, which was kind of neat. I mean, we've seen, I've seen some other unusual birds, but that was I would say that was the most memorable. And uh, he lived in Irondequoit, uh, which is a suburb of Rochester. So it's just outside of town at somebody's bird feeder. And it's like, oh my God. And, the, and you look it up online, they're a, a, they're a beautiful bird. So any other questions? Well, the same person asks, have you ever seen a splendid fairy wren? A what? Splendid fairy wren. Same kind of blue as an indigo. Uh, no, I have not. Uh, they, uh, I would gather they're not from the eastern part of the United States. I don't, I'm not even familiar with it. So uh, I'll have to look that one up. We, uh, I was on a, uh, uh, you know, we, my wife and I travel a fair amount and we, uh, and it's interesting, I, I generally don't do a lot of birding as I travel because it can be intimidating. I like, I like to kind of stick to the North American uh, birds. We were on safari in Tanzania last year and we saw these, uh, a lilac roller, which is an amazing yeah. colored bird, just beautiful bird. And it was like one of the few birds I was like, oh, I, you know, I looked at that. I mean, ostrich too, you know, I know what an ostrich looks like. But you get into some of these areas where there's hundreds of species and can be kind of intimidating. Uh, you know, you go down to Central America, the, uh, Brazil and, and the Amazon, and so it can be kind of intimidating. So any other questions? I'll have to look that one up. Have you seen one? Uh, just online, uh, it's just a beautiful indigo color, and um, I, I printed it out a few times just to hang it on my wall, and then I just wondered if you'd ever seen one, because I love yeah. that blue. It seems like blues are very rare. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I guess, you know, indigo is just a stunning color. You know, right now we have the eastern bluebirds that are around, and uh, they are... Uh, uh, they're a beautiful color bird. You know, you go out west, you have western bluebirds, mountain bluebirds, and just the, the color is just is beautiful. So, and indigo is just really attractive, just a, a gorgeous deep color. So, um, I think green and birds, you know, some of the greens you see warblers and things like that. And, you know, there's, I think I posted even on my Facebook or even the Alle I, I'm responsible for the Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage uh, Facebook uh, page as well. And we posted a thing about all the, the warblers that are coming through and they're stunning too. So, any other questions? Hi, Mark. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Good to see you. Friends from Atlanta. So, actually from Rochester originally. So, we get any a other lot questions? Of <laughs> down here. Any other questions? All right. Oh, go ahead. Is it, is it possible to attract a sowet owl? Um, sometimes I like to photograph them, and I'm wondering if there's a way to, to attract a sowet owl. Yeah. So, um, not unlike. Uh, they have a, a, a great, uh, uh, like a, they have a very steady whistle. So um, we heard them a couple of years ago at, uh, uh, at Allegheny. It was just, in fact, just before I did my night walk. And, you know, most of the time, the people that photograph them, they've, they've discovered them. They like to hang out in pine trees. And so they'll be like close to the, uh, the, the they always, most owls like during the day, especially they'll be hanging out in pine trees. So, um, the, the, if you find one of the other great things to looking for owls is you, you get birds that are mobbing an owl in a pine tree. You know, you know, is the other thing I'll be walking along with some friends and there'll be, there'll be a white pine there and there's a bunch of crows in there. You go, Oh, there's a, there, there's a great horned owl in that tree. And they go, how do you know? I said, you start to learn the behavior. So that's a great picture. Is that one you uh, took? Yeah, it's one that I took. And I'm also friends with a, a, a photographer who's known to take bird owl, uh, yeah. owl pictures. 
and she's very protective of the birds. And yeah. if you spend too much time in front of the owl, she'll say, "We got to move on. We got to move on because these guys are trying to sleep." Yeah, and they're, they're and they're very. I mean, they're very tiny. They're very adorable. Uh, I had that was one of the drawings I I had started that, that I had uh, earlier. There uh, was the uh, the sawwet owl. That uh, mm -hmm. it's a great. You know where my yeah that's that's a saw wet right there so, uh, but that's a I, I drew that from a a, a, a photograph so. Hey, thanks, Lon. Thank questions? you. Yeah, hey, glad you could join us and and be sure to uh, check out the rest of the program we have. Let's see, we're down to uh, I think we have eighteen programs, seventeen programs left. We start tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, a great diversity of programs throughout the weekend. So if you're kind of stuck inside and you want to take a look at some things, uh, check us out at AlleghenyNaturePilgrimage.com forward slash virtual A&P. So thanks a lot and uh, enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night.